Good morning. My name is Karina Venter. I'm an allergy specialist dietitian from Denver, Colorado, and I'm also associate professor of uh, pediatric allergy and immunology. Today we will be discussing alterations in the microbiome in patients with food allergies. The objectives of my talk basically is to understand how the microbiome is altered in patients with food allergies. And so we will really look at why are we interested in the microbiome? why the microbiome and dysbiosis in particular is important in the development of food allergies. And we will look at possible treatment options for prevention and tolerance development um, in children and adults with pre-existing food allergies. And we will talk about dietary changes that we could make, supplements that people would like to take, and then also fecal microbiota transplantation. So why is the microbiome important? The microbiome is important because it directly affects every branch of medicine and particularly the immune system. And as we know that food allergies are caused by dysregulation of the immune system. Dysbiosis, which means there's an imbalance of the microbiome, has particularly been implicated in dysregulation of the immune system. And as you can see here on the slide, um, on the right hand slide of the side, when we have a dysbiotic gut, we get some breakdown of tolerance, we see less presence of deregulatory cells, we see overpresentation or representation of Th1 and Th17 cells leading to inflammation. And then on the left hand side of the slide, you can see that when there is a lack of dysbiosis or a good balance between the commensal um, bacteria, that we see upregulation or more presence of the deregulatory cells and cytokines such as TGF beta and IL 10, and that is associated with tolerance development. So, microbiome in the food allergy. It's surprising how little data we actually do have looking at studies at the microbiome and dysbiosis of the microbiome or dysregulation perhaps of the microbiome and development of food allergies. This is a, a data from the child study presented by Megan Azad, where she showed, and don't really get too focused on the, the different bacteria and their names, but if you just look at the picture, we looked at the relative abundance of certain bacteria in children that sensitized versus non-sensitized kids, and that there's a clear difference at three months, and this difference is also very present at one year of age. If we then look at the different species, where, whether we look at all infants or the infants where they've removed the infants with a disturbed microbiome, so these are the kids with undisturbed microbiome, so children not born by C-section, they have not been introduced to solid food and they've had not recent treatment by antibiotics, we could still see some difference in the relative abundance of the bacteriodacea and also their enterobacteria. This just missed significance, but in the top line, where all children was included, you can see very clear difference between the relative abundance of the bacteriodacea in children that's non-sensitized versus the children that sensitized. And this again was present at three months of age as well as one year of age. So very clear differences seen in this child study infants between the children sensitized and non-sensitized, even though we have to take into account that the numbers were relatively small with only 12 children being sensitized. Then when we look at the data, um, slightly larger numbers, um, N equals 2 to 6 from the COFAR data, and the data was presented by Zipin Dabun Javanic, there is clear differences in children that outgrow their cow's milk allergy versus those that do not outgrow their cow's milk allergy when we look at the alpha diversity in the gut microbiome. And you can see the blue line are the children who resolve their cow's milk allergy, whereas the red line are the children who remain allergic. This is data from Shanghai, where Dong et al. showed differences in the gut microbiome of children with and without cow's milk allergy. So this is the baseline um, data. The children with cow's milk allergy is the inner circle. Children without cow's milk allergy, the outer circle. And then again, the same children six months later. And you can see 
the interesting thing is that even the change in the microbiome in the six months between the children with cow's milk allergy and again with cow's milk allergy and the children without cow's milk allergy and those without cow's milk allergy six months later were very different. So I think, you know, these slides sort of like clearly shows that based on the limited data we have in children with cow's milk allergy, there's differences at baseline, different six months later, and there's also differences in children in terms of diet diversity who will eventually outgrow their cow's milk allergy versus those who don't. Then nothing in allergy is ever simple and one plus one doesn't always make two. So this is data again from the COFAR study looking at microbiome diversity in children with and without egg allergy using the Shannon index as the diversity index. And surprisingly, we can see that the children with the egg allergy have a higher diet microbiome diversity, which is the opposite of what we were expecting. And so really, we still need to learn a little bit more about how the microbiome behaves in children with different kinds of food allergy. Now, not forgetting about the adults, looking at the data from the American gut study, um, quite a large number of participants, almost 2,000. When we look at the richness or the number of observed species in those adults without peanut allergy versus those with reported peanut allergy, we can see much higher um, relative abundance of different species in those without the peanut allergy versus those with peanut allergy. This is a very interesting um, letter recently published by Curry and Nadeau's team in allergy. And even though the numbers are very small, they report data here only on seven adults undergoing oral immunotherapy. It is very interesting to see that as these adults were undergoing oral immunotherapy, they got microbiome changed as well. And there was an increase seen in the richness in figure A at the top, and also in terms of the Shannon index, which is the uh, microbial diversity measured in these adults. So we also need to learn more about how the microbiome responds to the different treatment methods we're currently using in both mainly children, but also in some adults with food allergy. But then we always want to know which ones are the good ones. So which are the bacteria that I should be having in my gut? And, you know, it is really not that simple. I try to summarize the studies that I've just um, presented to you. From most of the studies, we can see that perhaps the beneficial bi microbiomes or the ben beneficial bacteria in the gut are from the thermocute phylum as well as the actinobacteria phylum. So the firmicutes, as we very well know, that's the lactobacillus and lactobacillus GG, which has in a number of studies in terms of tolerant development, particularly in children with cow's milk allergy. We also have the data from Kathy Nagler's group that show that particularly Colostridium perfringens may be preventative in terms of preventing sensitization to food allergens. And then we have data indicating that the bifidobacteria and may be important in allergy prevention and particularly there's more than 51 different kinds of bifidobacteria so the bifidobacteria brevae seems to be the one that may have an allergy preventative effect. Unfortunately many of these studies have been funded by industry which means that the data may not be as widely accepted or as widely disseminated as needed but early days in the field of microbiome, allergy prevention, treatment of food allergies, but these perhaps seem to be the ones that may have a more positive effect. I do, however, want to show you on the next slide that when I do say that certain bacteria may be beneficial within those same uh, phyla, we also may see some bacteria that may have a negative effect. And so on this slide, I've summarized increased numbers of certain bacteria or phylums found in children with food allergy and then the reduced numbers found in those with food allergy. And as you can see, the same phyla seem to appear um, on both sides of the table. So we're really not at the point where we can say this is the bacteria that's going to fix everything. And perhaps the answer may just lie in improving general um, diversity in the gut microbiome and trying to increase at least the number of the commensal bacteria and therefore reducing dysbiosis. 
And, you know, I think the buzzword at the moment in the microbiome field is butyrate. And butyrate um, is produced by the gut microbiome or the gut bacteria from a high fiber diet. When we have higher levels of butyrate in the gut microbiome, we can see that it helps with the maintaining the intestinal barrier in terms of tight junctions and mucus production. It's also acting as a source of energy for colonocytes. And higher butyrate levels is also associated with expansion of deregulatory cells, increase in IgA and IgG. We also see increased levels of the two cytokines that's closely associated with the deregulatory cells, IL-10 and TGF-beta. So I also had the question in my mind, um, if butyrate is that important, why don't we just supplement with bacteria that will be producing higher levels of butyrate? But as always, the story is not that simple. So the firmicutes, in particular the Lactobacillus and Clostridia um, species, are important in butyrate production as they can take acetate and convert that into butyrate. I then had the question about the importance of bifidobacteria. And as we know that breastfed babies in particular have a very bifidobacterial um, gut. So what's the importance of bifidobacteria then? Even though bifidobacteria doesn't directly produce butyrate, you can see from this slide that bifidobacteria plays an important intermediate role because it can convert the oligofructose or inulin to lactate or acetate, which is then converted into butyrate by the butyrate producing um, bacteria. So again, we see this balance of bacteria that we need in the gut. The firmicutes as well as the bifidobacteria both seem to play an important role. Now we know the microbiome is important. It seems that particularly the production of butyrate may be important in prevention of food allergy and even perhaps tolerance development. And, and so how can we fix it? The simple answer to me as a dietitian then is, let's just eat butyrate. But once again, not a simple answer because the foods that seem to be high in butyrate are butter and ghee. We also know that a diet high in saturated fats as these food negatively affect the gut microbiome diversity. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 situation. And then we also don't have the studies yet to indicate that the butyrate that we consume orally gets to the, the colon intact. So we're not at the point yet where we can just put all babies um, on a high ghee or a high butter containing diet. But perhaps we can address the diet in a more healthy way by making sure that we give sufficient fiber. This is something that I'm hoping to study in the next two years or so, because, you know, in the nutrition or the dietetic world, we believe that all fibers are good. But in terms of butyrate production, some preliminary studies indicate that it is particularly hemicellulose, for example, the um, araboxicillin, which is converted into butyrate in the gut. And we only get this fiber in cereals, not so much the skins of fruit and vegetables. So cereals such as whole grain cereals, dry barley and wheat. So perhaps we should put more focus on these particular fibers in the diet, opposed to just um, recommending a, a high fiber diet in general. Then we can also look at dietary patterns. And this is a beautiful paper published by Caroline Rude and Liam O'Mahony is also one of the co-authors where they show that if you look at diet in early life, so diet in the first year of life, the babies that had a diet that contains yogurt, so probiotic bacteria, fish, and fruit and vegetables had higher levels of butyrate in the gut microbiome. And at the age of six years, they had less atopic sensitization, less asthma, and less food allergy. So perhaps, you know, I was wrong on the previous slide focusing so much on just fiber intake and just whole grain intake. Perhaps we really need to look at the whole diet or diet patterns if we want to address the gut microbiome and allergy prevention or treatment of food allergy. We can also look at the infant's diet in the first year of life. And interestingly, in the study by Lawson et al., they showed that as diet diversity increased in the first year of life, so as the child was eating more family foods, slowly moving from a predominantly breast milk or formula milk diet, the gut microbiome diversity also increased. 
and they use the Shannon index, which is a measure of alpha diversity. But that is just not relevant to infants. It's also relevant to the elderly. And this was a study published in Nature now almost about eight years ago. And it's still one of the only studies we have in adults looking at eye diversity and gut microbiome diversity. But as you can see from this slide as well, as healthy diet diversity increase, so not just diversity and a more diverse diet, but really a more healthy diverse diet, so did the gut microbiome diversity increased as well. And so I always jokingly say that really diet diversity really relates to healthy diversity and perhaps having a diet that's diverse because it contains 40 different kinds of burgers a week may not necessarily give us the, the positive shift in the gut microbiome as um, we're hoping to see. This is my own data from the Isle of Wight showing that as diet diversity in the first year of life increase, so did the risk of developing food allergy over the first 10 years of life um, reduced. And we showed that for each additional food or each additional food diversity score at six months of age, so these babies were um, introduced to solids quite early, the odds of developing food allergy over the first 10 years of life was reduced by almost 11%. And for each additional food allergen, so for each additional allergenic food given by 12 months, there was a significant reduction of 33% in the likelihood of food allergy over the first year of life. And so the message really is early introduction of foods are fine. If we can get on the child on a variety of fruit and vegetables by six months, we are reducing the odds of having a food allergy by 10 years of age. And if we can get the food allergens in, in the first year of life, we're reducing the odds of having a food allergy by 10 by almost a third. And so this is just a graph to show basically what I've just explained in the text on the previous slide. As the numbers of food increased over the first six months of life, so did the odds of developing food allergy getting down. And as the number of allergenic foods increased, by 12 months of age, so did the odds of developing food allergy came down. This was sort of like more on a positive note, the good things we can do to positively affect the gut microbiome. There's all the things that can negatively affect the gut microbiome. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into detail, but a Western diet or but predominantly animal-based diet have been shown to reduce certain bacteria, particularly the ones that I've highlighted as perhaps beneficial bacteria, such as the firmicutes, um, an animal-based diet also has a negative effect on the gut microbiome. A high-fat and high-protein diet can, within 48 hours, affect the gut microbiome. It can be corrected by a diet higher in prebiotics, so fiber and perhaps probiotic intake, but definitely amount, type, and mixture of fat that we're eating can affect the gut microbiome with it negatively within 48 hours of intake. Advanced glycation end products, so the products that form when we heat or dry and um, dry fry foods such as making burgers or toasted sandwiches. This is just interestingly foods that we normally consider to be healthy, but when we roast them or we blanch them or we give them heat treatment and here you've got whipped butter, the age content is really high which again has been shown to have a negative effect on the gut microbiome in murine models. These studies have not been done in humans. So again, we have to be careful on how we interpret it. Emulsifiers have also been shown to have a negative effect on the gut microbiome of mice. So perhaps we need to think about having too much butter and miracle whip in our own diets. But once again, human studies are lacking. There's lots of talk about taking prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics. And as much as all these factors clearly affect the gut microbiome, species-specific and its diversity, we are at no point yet where we can say this particular symbiotic, which is a blend of a prebiotic and a probiotic, or this particular prebiotic, which is mainly fibers, or a particular probiotic containing certain gut microbiomes or certain live microorganism will fix our food allergy problems. So definitely areas we're looking at, but not at the point of time where we can make any specific recommendations. So the treatment um, that we're working on at the moment in terms of the gut microbiome, and I'm pretty sure that there are some presentations to follow on that, but I just wanted to have two quick slides to at least make you aware of it. So fecal microbiota transplantation or FMT is really just the process where stool from a healthy donor 
is transplanted into somebody perhaps with disease such as cancer or IBD or even studies undergo being conducted in those with food allergy. But I think, you know, there's many questions such as what is a healthy donor? Is a healthy donor somebody with out food allergy? Yes, that makes sense. But what if the healthy donor is obese or depressed or have an eating disorder? Are we putting the food allergic individual then at risk of developing these diseases in the non-allergic healthy donor, which may not be that healthy? There's different ways to transfer the stools from one person to another, such as colonoscopy, nasogastric tubes or oral um, capsules. But definitely, you know, we need more data on that. And so we've got some studies in murine models that with very positive outcomes. And so it's good to see that the NIH are actually funding human trials to further look into the role of um, FMT in humans in terms of um, perhaps prevention, treatment or tolerance development, or reduction of severity of food allergic symptoms, as we've seen in the studies in murine models. Just really to summarize, the key points, the gut microbiome has been associated with food allergies, both in terms of diversity. I wish I could say the picture is clear that increased diversity is associated with less food allergy, but the egg data from the COFAR study has slightly confused the picture. We know that there are species of uh, phyla specific differences between those with and without food allergies. But again, it seems to be country specific and perhaps even um, differences between individuals exist. And so we're not at the point yet where we can say this species is the species that's going to fix our problem. We know of positive ways that we can change the diet to at least improve diet diversity. So if we have a more diverse diet, or perhaps if we have a healthy diet pattern and characterized by intakes of natural probiotics in foods, fish, fruit and vegetables, and perhaps we really need to look a little bit more at intake of, of whole grains. And then in terms um, of treatment, we're not at the point yet where we can recommend particular pre, pro or symbiotics. And um, it's good to see that there's currently funding uh, for FMT trials in humans. And it would be interesting to see the outcomes of these studies in future. So I thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to further discussion during the question and answer session.